Welcome to Green Team Speaks To, the podcast for the Paulson Institute's Green Finance Center. Hello, I'm Deborah Lair, Executive Director and Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute. Today, we're delighted to have my dear friend, Simon Zadek, who is one of the Paulson Institute's Senior Fellows. Simon is currently Principal and Product Catalyst at the United Nations Development Program and was Special Advisor on Sustainable Finance to the Deputy Secretary General of the UN and Co-Director of UNEP's Inquiry into Design Options for a Sustainable Financial System. Simon, we're so delighted to have you joining us. You have decades of experience working across the globe on various transnational issues as part of your UN career and the previous positions that you've held. What we're seeing in the world today is truly unique and extraordinary as the world responds to COVID-19. So let's start there in our questions. COVID-19 has without doubt wrecked havoc on the status quo or life as we know it. The economic numbers are bleak and they'll likely continue downward as much uncertainty remains. Energy numbers show drastic drops tied to the reduction in economic activity, but carbon emission numbers are actually trending favorably as the world's forced to stay home. In wake of these near and medium term shifts in business as we know it, what are your thoughts on the long-term impact of COVID-19 on sustainable development? Sure. Well, Deborah, thank you very much for inviting me Um, to, I think this is the second podcast I've contributed to, um, which I'm very happy to do indeed. So so on the first question, uh, I guess there are two downsides and two upsides to the current crisis as it relates to the broad green agenda. On on the downside, of course, we're all completely distracted, Uh, distracted understandably by the human tragedy, by large-scale unemployment, Uh, and by the multitude of other problems that have emerged over the last uh, 12 weeks or so. And and that distraction will have uh, a long tail. Uh, We see Conference of the Parties and the Conference on Biological Diversity all being delayed. We see international processes really becoming um, uh, sort of thought about further into the future. And and then secondly, we see some hangovers – um, from the crisis. So this is the second downside. Uh, and, and most obviously, we see uh, a hangover emerging around debt and the rapid growth of sovereign and sub-sovereign debt. Uh, and that will have implications for the fiscal space um, that will influence what governments can do and therefore will influence, for example, the extent of blended financing that will be possible going forward, all relevant. Then on the upside... Uh, It's a slightly different story. Firstly, um, we have the potential for some, shall we say, stickiness uh, in some of the behavioral characteristics that have emerged over the past 12 weeks. And frankly, we are a little unclear as to how intense or relevant that stickiness will be. Clearly, billions of people have stayed at home. You know, huge uh, amounts of environmental damage has been avoided in the very short term. And we hear repeatedly um, calls for some of that behavioral change to become sticky. And we hear larger companies talking about a far diminished use uh, of, uh, of office space. Uh, we see airlines talk about a fundamental shift in the nature of business travel and so on. Uh, I think it would be fair to say it is unclear how far this will go, but it is clear that it won't be automatic, uh, that we have work to do in trying to enforce that stickiness at the behavioral level and also perhaps at the broader values level. Then the second is is more kind of the bucks, which is the stimulus and bailout. And, And we can perhaps come back to this in a little bit more detail in a second But in some of the work uh, I've been leading uh, through uh, uh, an initiative called Finance for Biodiversity, we have been uh, building a green stimulus index of which we have just published the second version, uh, where we are analyzing, if you like, the greenness of the stimulus and bailout programs that are being built and executed uh, around the world. Just as a headline to give a feeling as to what that means, you know, we started off in the first round 
looking about at, at about $840 billion worth of stimulus. The most recent iteration, we've looked at about $2.2 trillion worth of stimulus. Uh, and we begin to see which countries are putting money into sectors that are environmentally problematic, keeping them afloat, enabling them to function for longer periods of time, and which countries are putting money um, either by virtue of their economic structures or by virtue of clear policy decisions, such as Canada, the UK and France, uh, into sectors with specific environmental conditionality. Again, this is not something that is preset. Um, and there are many of us that are seeking to influence the greenness of those programs as they begin to emerge. Great. Well, there's a lot to expand upon within what you said. Let's start on the biodiversity front. Uh, since you did raise that. And the UN Biodiversity Conference was supposed to take place in October in China. And there were high expectations for that event in bringing more discussion about biodiversity into the climate discussions and how to start to put a price on natural resources. I know that your organization has given a lot of thought and been very creative in how they have looked at that challenge. Why do you think that's so important as part of the debate around climate, Simon? And what is it that your group is proposing? Thanks. Yeah. So um, at Davos in January, um, just before the shutters came down around the world, um, I heard repeatedly um, leading uh, uh, executives from financial institutions respond to the biodiversity challenge in more or less the following way. Firstly, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm terribly busy doing climate work. And thirdly, uh, isn't it the same thing anyway? Yeah. So, so this is not a terribly encouraging uh, set of voices, and we need to work hard to overcome that mixture of uh, ignorance um, uh, and assumptions uh, and lack of prioritization. Uh, Biodiversity agenda does clearly have overlap to the climate agenda, but it is by no means the same thing. Mm -hmm. The destruction of the insect population with the implications for land use and agricultural productivity you know, is in some ways and in some parts of the world linked to climate. In many other ways, it is not. And we could extend that to discussions about uh, the marine economy uh, and uh, elsewhere. So, Yes, there's overlap. No, it's not the same thing. Building metrics in this space is much harder, frankly, than building metrics in the at least carbon side of the climate agenda. Uh, in, in, in the climate space, you know, we have you know, machines and plants and companies that are emitting carbon. These are owned assets that can be stranded and we can measure carbon in a relatively standardized way. In the biodiversity space, you're mainly talking about assets that are not owned and the dependency relationship between those unowned assets and the economic assets that you're trying to derive value from. Uh, the effect of the destruction of a coral reef, which is unowned on a hotel around the corner, sort of exemplifies the point. Uh, so we're trying to capture a far more diversified set of indirect effects. And, and so traditional risk metrics are not terribly effective. There's a lot of work to do. Probably 95% or more of the data that we want to use will never come from the corporate sector, but is sitting in large data pools owned and run by the public sector. So we're in the big data AI business now, if we're, if we're interested in biodiversity, and to be frank, less interested in channeling it into a sort of narrow late 20th century view of corporate disclosure, which is not the future in this space. Uh, and then finally, just to give a slightly different take on the same subject, uh, as somebody said to me a few days ago from a major bank, by the time we get to the IMF annual meetings in October, all anybody is going to be talking about is emerging market debt. You know, mm -hmm. that we have a sort of a debt crisis and we're about to hit it like a brick wall and no one is entirely clear what to do about it. So the question becomes, can we create a co-benefit architecture between how to resolve that crisis and the biodiversity and also the climate agenda? And we think the answer is yes. So we think there is an opportunity 
of building a new generation of um, state contingent bond instruments. So basically performance based instruments with biodiversity or climate performance factors de determining the rate of interest. That would mean that a biodiversity rich economy mm -hmm. um, could be Costa Rica, could be uh, could be South Africa and so on, yeah, could go into an emerging market debt, sovereign debt restructuring negotiation with a view to brokering a deal with policymakers, not only private actors on the other side of the table, to buy down some of those biodiversity performance areas in return for reduction in the cost of capital. Now, through, through actually a traditional debt lens, that would make an awful lot of sense because why would you ever lend a money to a company if it didn't have a balance sheet? And why are we lending money to countries without looking at their broader asset base? And that includes natural capital. So it makes complete sense to build natural capital into the pricing of capital in the financial market because that's part of a country's balance sheet going forward. We think there's a huge opportunity here to both help emerging markets reduce the cost of capital you know, arising through something that is obviously of no fault of their own, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time introducing a new generation of instruments and brokers that can make deals between actors that want to access or protect natural capital assets and actors that are needing to raise either sovereign or indeed sub-sovereign debt. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of talk in the EU and also by the leaders in China that as part of their recovery packages, they need to be focused on green development and creative ways of um, using green as a means for stimulating economic growth. Do you see these experiments, if they would be, with these new kinds of bonds coming out of the more developed countries like the EU or that they would be coming out of emerging markets where you could pilot some of these ideas? So, so may, most of the discussions about green and the crisis have been focused on stimulus and bailouts. And, mm -hmm. and as I said, you know, we think this is important. That's why we produce this index. Um, in our most recent iteration, 13 out of the 16 countries that are currently sitting in our index are putting more money into environmentally damaging <laughs> sectors than into upside environmentally attractive sectors. So there's a and lot. Simon, of is that just sorry to interrupt for a minute, but is that available uh, to the public to see? That is, that is free on board, available to download, and we're producing a new iteration of the index every two weeks at the moment. Okay, and where do we find that? Uh, I can point that to you. It sits on the um, the website of the folks that have done the work for us, which is a UK analytics company called Vivid Economics. Okay, uh, yes, I'm aware of them. They're so they do very good so work. So for anyone who's interested, you type in Green Stimulus Index, uh, maybe Vivid Economics as well, and it should pop up as a free download. Um, and then just to sort of finish the to finish the line, I don't think people have connected the dots between green crisis on the one hand and emerging sovereign debt on the other hand. And I think part of the reason for that is just time. But part of the reason is that the earlier generation of thinking in this area goes to back to debt, to nat debt for nature swaps. And although a good idea on paper, it never really turned into something that was scalable. Um, if you move towards performance-based bonds, you know, where there is a lower likelihood of moral hazard, i.e. Mm -hmm. we'll, take, you know, we'll take the debt but not deliver the goods, then that all becomes much more interesting. And in a world today where we have a trillion dollars worth of green bonds, you know, we can begin to think about performance bonds related to green in a much more natural way than we could have five or 10 years ago. So, so I don't think people have connected those dots between the sovereign debt space and the green stimulus space or the green crisis space but they can do, and we hope that they will. And just to kind of put an edge on it, you know, in the last 15 years, mm -hmm. extraordinary growth in the percentage of um, sovereign debt owned by China rather than the, uh, than the, uh, uh, than the, uh, uh, the Paris Club is quite extraordinary when you look at those numbers. And so there are really two venues to go, which is the Paris Club, largely the West, shall we say, 
and China that now owns a huge amount of emerging market debt, including um, uh, sovereign debt in biodiversity rich economies. So it's an opportunity for China wanting CBD to be successful and them wanting to be a biodiversity leader to consider their own position vis-a-vis the holders of that debt as they enter into a set of difficult negotiations with potentially defaulting countries and thinking about how biodiversity and climate solutions can be blended into the solutions, uh, blended into that restructuring going forward. That's fascinating. Uh, And I know that you've done a tremendous amount of work with the Chinese and helping them launch their whole green finance agenda, which has been very aggressive. And we've seen huge development there since the time you were working with them on the G20 study group. And one of the cutting edge areas I know that you focused on as a part of that also is the role that emerging technologies can play. And you mentioned artificial intelligence, but there's another one that you focused on in your role at the United Nations as the Sherpa for the Digital Financing Task Force. What role do you see technology playing in this? Is it going to... um, Uh, help expedite the process of green finance to, like it does in the financial world, bring more people into the system because you can reach those who are outside of sort of traditional financial systems, traditional banking infrastructure? So, So, you know, if one sort of focuses the question on technology associated with the financial system, rather than technology, should we say, in the real economy, to draw a slightly artificial distinction, um, that then I think this is a game changer. So, so how does fintech help? Well, most obviously, it delivers a huge amount of data quickly, cheaply, trustworthily um, about some of the externalities that we're trying to bring to the attention of financial decision makers, irrespective of whether they're interested in impact or whether they're interested in risk or some combination of the two. Um, Secondly, it has uh, a very interesting impact in disintermediating many actors within the financial sector, um, some of which are undoubtedly rent takers, uh, and reducing associated costs. And so some of the exceptional costs that appear to be associated with green investment are often associate are, are often really connected to rent taking that is happening um, across the financial system. So by disintermediating some of those actors, some of the so-called incremental costs of green uh, uh, ex- astonishingly disappear. Thirdly, fintech clearly allows for extraordinary innovation in new financial instruments and business models. And it allows much more targeted and customized focus on either how to deliver impact outcomes that are of interest to the owners of capital or, or how to deliver more, um, more, you know, more enhanced financial returns by, if you like, scraping economic value you know, out of, for example, the effective exploitation of biodiversity assets, uh, the uh, easier transfer uh, of uh, carbon credits to other parts of the world and so on. So it allows customization in spaces that a kind of broadband, undigitalized financial sector has not been able to deliver. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, on the accountability side, you know, we're taxpayers, we're voters, you know, there's $4 trillion worth of illicit financial flows every year. You know, all of these effects of, you know, inefficient, uh, inefficient public finance, you know, has impacts on our broader green agenda, um, that the owners of capital, which are ultimately citizens, you know, are able to become stronger accountability agents as individuals, but also as institutions, whether they be communities or pension funds or others, uh, in really understanding and directing the role of intermediaries, whether they're private sector intermediaries, JP Morgan et al., or whether they're public sector intermediaries, um, such as uh, governments. Put it all together, what have you got? So fintech can make an extraordinary difference in advancing green finance by making markets much more efficient, by driving innovation more effectively, um, by stripping out rent takers, 
that are uh, frankly in the way of what we're trying to achieve and by improving accountability. And the uh, initiative that I'm a Sherpa of, which is launched by the UN Secretary General and is focused on exactly this topic, how to best harness fintech or digital financing to accelerate financing of the SDGs, uh, is really focused on very practically how these different characteristics of fintech can be put into practice at scale. Great. Now, I, I just think it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, as you said, can be a real game changer in this space. We've already seen how it has been a game changer in the financial world. So to see the same thing in climate is fascinating. And it is, as you talk about emerging markets, it's one of the opportunities for emerging markets where they may not be able to buy sophisticated technology, but most people in those markets have a phone. So if you have a way of driving a lot of this change through mobile phones, you can reach so many more people in the process. Yeah, I think, you know, I, you're, of course, you're absolutely right, Deborah. Uh, I, I guess the, the, the mental model that we have of the nexus between sustainable development and fintech for understandable reasons has been at the, re at the retail end or at the, at the individual end, you know, the financial inclusion agenda writ wide. And of course, that is a hugely important agenda. I, I guess where this task force has taken us is to a place where we see how fintech can play a role in accelerating green finance, not only at that last mile, but across the world's capital markets and banking systems and equity funds and so on, that I think we can move beyond, if you like, beyond the financial inclusion agenda mm -hmm. um, to uh, a much more penetrating view of different parts of the way in which financial and capital markets deal with environmental issues. So can you give us an example of that? Yeah. I, you know, I mean, you know, that, you know, some of them are just sort of blindingly obvious, uh, which is that if we're able to mobilize large scale, cheap, timely, cost effective delivery to door data on complex issues such as biodiversity or climate, um, we can channel that into capital markets and bank lending in ways um, that will ensure that it is more effectively taken into account, whether it's through a risk lens or an impact lens or the combination of two. So that's ESG on steroids. And I think that's where we're going. Um, so that would be sort of at one end of the story. But but let's take a completely different end of the story. You know, one, one of the problems, um, you know, for, uh, for, our, for the sort of sustainable finance agenda is in the project infrastructure financing space, you know, a topic, Deborah, that you and the Pulse Institute have done a lot of work on as well. But, well, imagine, I, I, imagine Bangladesh, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's an attempt to fund a billion dollars worth of clean energy, just say. And historically, uh, they would have gone to international capital markets to raise that money, possibly diluted in cost slightly because they're still an LDC or they're, uh, although they're about to um, uh, get an upgrade and become uh, a middle-income country and no longer have access to concessionary finance. So we did our numbers looking at what would happen if significant portions of that hypothetical billion dollars was raised from taxi drivers in Dakar, all of whom have mobile phones, all of whom have micro savings, which can mm -hmm. be aggregated almost costlessly into a set of financial instruments that allow for both saver security and withdrawability, so the liquidity that a taxi driver needs, um, but also a forward-looking investable fund in that billion dollars worth of clean infrastructure. And we did a cost comparison of what that would look like as compared to raising the equivalent money on international capital markets. And, and the results shouldn't astonish us. Over a 10-year period, the cost of capital in, in domestic uh, denominated terms is almost a third less if you source it locally, number one. Number two, it puts less pressure um, on uh, sovereign debt ratings, credit ratings, um, and pressures associated with seeking to access too much international capital. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, remember that the payment is not to JP Morgan or the Chinese government or to the World Bank, 
but it's to the taxi driver in Dhaka. Yeah, so the payments for that, you know, clean energy system is now being paid to the poorest people in Bangladesh, which means that you have a multiplier effect and you have an equity effect. So, so what does that all mean? It means that we can begin to break down the historic barriers between the domestic payments and savings end and capital markets and large-scale infrastructure investments and at low cost can aggregate on the former into the latter with remarkable effects. And, and just to give a sort of real-time example of that, Limak Energy, which is Turkey's largest energy company uh, running utilities on the ground, mm -hmm. are in the process of establishing a global, a global infrastructure financing platform that allows any individual anywhere on the planet to invest in energy infrastructure in Turkey. And that's effectively exactly the same model. They've disintermediated many, many players in the financial sector, uh, and they're making it possible for anyone, anywhere to save and invest in infrastructure in Turkey. So, so I think these are examples, you know, very different, but that illustrate the potential of these new technology ecosystems to change the way in which we think about financing green. So, I mean, that's really fascinating. And those examples are very eye-opening uh, of just, just the changes that are ahead. And they're not that complicated. They're not requiring major investment in infrastructure and uh, other things that you know, might be a barrier to government. Uh, it just requires some creative thinking and some political will and the willingness to test out some of these ideas. So it's really terrific that you and your organization are pushing for that. Um, as you know, the Paulson Institute, as you referenced, has looked at a lot of these issues and we're very supportive of ways that market mechanisms can be brought to help in these discussions, these activities around climate change. Uh, it's been really a very fascinating discussion, and there's so many more questions that I would like to ask, but I know that we're coming up against our time frame here. But I have one very important thing that I would like to get to before we conclude. And you really have been a model, one of the giants in this field, with your creative thinking and the ideas that you brought across the board on um, green finance and biodiversity, fintech and other technologies. But what do you do to live a green lifestyle? What are some tips and suggestions that you could share with us? Right. Well, it would be my 15-year-old daughter that holds me to account on these issues. So um, uh, I should really get her on the line, um, but she's <laughs> probably busy doing something that she would deem to be much more interesting. So I won't even bother to try. I, I, I mean, you know, the, this is day 76, you know, the eighth hour, the 33 minute and the 43rd second. You can ask my daughter. She's keeping track. Um, <laughs> and... I would be happy never to get on a plane again in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that I, you know, I, I have been traveling constantly since I was 17 years old, and that is a long, long time ago. And I have never given it a thought, but assumed that, you know, that is my chosen life and being on planes uh, and having extensive professional and friend networks around the world is kind of the way I would go until I dropped dead. Well, 76 days into this lockdown, I don't feel like that anymore. And much as I would like to see you face to face, Deborah, it's going to be a while before I um, uh, want to get on a plane to come to DC uh, or anywhere else that you might be. I live in a compact city, Amsterdam, uh, that has some inherent characteristics that support um, it being a low carbon environment um, with inevitable paradoxes, uh, notably the um, energy and carbon intensity uh, of the Dutch agricultural system. Um, and, and I guess um, my uh, way of thinking 76 days into the lockdown 
um, is that as someone who has operated globally for most of my life, I find it much more interesting now to figure out how to function, uh, at least physically, uh, in a much more localized way going forward. Um, and have found actually that my ability to work internationally has hardly been diminished at all. And in some respects, has been improved by virtue of focus and by virtue of a lesser loss of time and energy through all of the movements of my seemingly redundant body around the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Amsterdam is an amazing place to be local, but also to be destructively global. And that's because it's a major destination for budget tourism. And, and it's an interesting question coming back to that earlier stickiness issue that you asked me at the beginning as to whether the folks of Amsterdam led by a really remarkable mayor um, will play through what they're now saying they want, which is to find ways to radically reduce the number of budget tourists that come to this city going forward, which of course challenges you know, one amidst a host of trade-offs, largely of an economic nature. But I think that, again, the, the lockdown has really pushed Amsterdamers to want to conceive of a different future for Amsterdam going forward. So I don't know if that answers the question about what I do on a Monday morning, but at least it answers sort of a little bit of the equation of how I am living and thinking right now. Well, I think there are many people who've done an assessment of their travel. Um, I'm somebody who also is on planes very frequently. And it is amazing what you can get done with modern technology and how efficiently as well. And it is a time to reconsider our business travel, our personal travel, and what we can be doing to be more sustainable in our day-to-day -day lives. Simon? Thank you so much for your time. It's always fascinating to have a discussion with you. And we always learn new and interesting ideas because you're so creative in how you approach solving these very challenging issues. It's, it's my pleasure. And it's really an honor to continue to work with Pulse Institute going forward. Great. Well, we look forward to continuing our collaboration in the years ahead. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye.